Paul Martin and Ray the roadie for the rock and roll Chicago podcast. How you doing today, Ray? I'm doing swell. How are you doing today, Paul? Oh, I'm swell as well. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you swollen? No, no, I'm no. just swell. Oh, just swell. Very I'm good. Very swell. good. Very good. Virus free, I hope. Uh, uh, yes, I hope so. I seem to be uh, seem to be that way anyway. Yeah, here too. Here too. Just uh, putting on putting on some poundage. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> and the dog thinks I'm crazy. I take him out for two walks a day. <laughs> well, we're we're uh, we're eating over here like uh, it's going out of style. But but uh, so uh, so what do we what do we got on tap for today? Speaking of eating, I was thinking about Italian food. Oh, there you go. So. Uh, uh, I figured, why don't we talk to Ron Onesti? He had mustard chili last night. Did you? Yeah, we might have it again tonight. <laughs> Very good. Very good. But Ron Onesti. Okay, good. Ron Onesti, yeah. We, uh, we talked to Italian him. boy there. That's right. And we uh, talked to him for a while. He told us a little bit about his, uh, his life, his past, and what's going on today, and where he's going, and what's happening, and... What's not happening right now? That's right, and um, and so well, let's let's get to it and see what Ron uh, Ron had to say. Let's go. We're meeting today with Rod Onesti, President and CEO of Onesti Entertainment, and much more, uh, which I'm sure we'll get to. Right, Ron? How you doing today? Another day in paradise, you know. I mean, uh, we're just going to be like everybody. Boat, and uh, you know, every day uh, uh, is a day closer. And look at this, it's Friday already. We're, was it the third or fourth Friday? I don't even know, third Friday into it. So we'll get back soon enough. Yeah, how are you, how is, how was, uh, how are you hanging out with all this, with all this COVID-19 stuff and, and, uh, and, and, and not being able to, to have any of your venues open? Well, you know, I mean, it's very difficult, of course. Uh, you know, I'm standing in uh, direct communication with my employees and doing everything I can to help them. Um, you know, I'm still working very hard every day, uh, reformatting the company, making, you know, it's giving me an opportunity to, to look at, uh, you know, the efficiencies of the company and, and that kind of thing. And, and I'm still, you know, I'm on the phone and, and, the, and uh, internet um, emails with uh, agents and managers every single day, still booking shows. And, you know, as you know, we got the displays theater going to be opening up. Uh, I mean, a lot of things happening. So, you know, for me, it's, it's still, you know, working hard every day. Yeah. Tell me, Ron, where did this uh, all begin? Uh, when you were a little kid, were you running little businesses with your brother or something? Or? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, he was six years my junior, but uh, I, I started, uh, you know, like everybody, a lemonade stand at uh, seven years old, and, uh, <laughs> and I sold uh, uh, franchises uh, around the block. I, I had uh, kids, um, I went to the, the grocery store, and I bought the, remember the Weiler's lemonade packets for 10 cents? Yep. I sold to the kids in the neighborhood for 25 cents. And then I put up uh, lemonade stands on the four corners of the block, and I just would go around collecting like the mob. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, but no, I you know I've been doing this forever. Um, you know, I originally wanted to be uh, either a professional baseball player. I played semi-pro baseball until I was 33, or a scientist, something like that. And uh, but I was that guy in high school, you know, that did. Uh, uh, I was homecoming chairman and prom chairman, and I was in student council doing all the the, the, the concerts, you know, after the football games, and you know that kind of stuff. And music's always been a part of my life just back then i didn't realize that people can kind of you know get paid for it so i've been doing it for a long time the first business was that the uh the t-shirt business that uh, you had um well not really um actually that evolved uh you've done your homework obviously here uh, little research. <laughs> uh, uh, that kind of evolved uh i uh, uh let's see when i was uh, 12 years old 11 years old i got a job as a bus boy at a, at a jewish delicatessen in oak park and it was um a lot of um so it just it was a great uh, uh, combination of of uh, of, of uh, business guys and athletes and neighborhood guys and just you know and um, and I, I was uh, getting a lot of um, 
uh, experience, a lot of uh, being exposed to a lot of different businesses. And, um, you know, they saw me as a hustler. I, I had my first job, like I said, at 12 years old, and I was, I was hustling. I was working hard. I was there until I was about 23, so I was there about 11, 12 years. And I started uh, uh, selling printing for this printing company, um, business cards. So the guy said, look, here's a catalog. Here's a, a wedding uh, uh, um, invitation catalog. Here's a letterhead catalog. Here's business cards. Go to all your friends, all the people come in the restaurant. And I was selling printing. And then from that, I realized, well, if I bought a little printing press, I could cut out the middleman, do it myself. So I did that. And then the printing turned into uh, people were asking for signs, you know, so I would do some signs. And then a real estate guy said, could you make 50 signs? And that's silk screening. So silk screening, I said, sure, because I'm never a no guy. I'm like, yeah, I can do it. No problem. Mm-hmm. So the silk screening turned into uh, a sign company uh, doing uh, all the silk screening. Then my friends, my buddies were like playing basketball. And they said, hey, you do silk screening, you do T-shirts. So I'm like, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. So we did T-shirts. And again, playing baseball, I never had a place to, to really, you know, between, uh, um, remember Herman Sporting Goods and, sure. and uh, Sport Mart at the time. Uh, but they didn't really have, you know, really good baseball, softball uniforms. And 16-inch was really big in the 80s. Uh, I mean, it still is, but it was really, really big. And, um, and so we, we made a thing, uh, uh, created a thing called Softball City. And we made all the great uniforms for all the big uh, celebrities. We did them for centerfolds, for Playboy. You know, they would do the, uh, uh, they would do the, um, uh, was it the top 10 collegiate whatever issue and they'd have all the girls in these little football jerseys. We'd make those and we we're making them all over the country. And um, it just evolved, evolved, evolved into businesses. And then I would, I did a, uh, a thing called uh, the softball super show, which was a, um, uh, like a trade show. You know, I'd get all Easton and Louisville slugger and, 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 um, and De Beer, who made the 16 inch softballs, and just all these people come uh, at a banquet hall, and then I invite all the softball and baseball players, and they would buy the equipment and order the uniforms and meet the softball celebrities. And I was doing that for a while until I realized I really wasn't into sporting goods or making uniforms or silk screening or printing. It was the creativity of the events that I, that I created around these businesses. So in 1996, I, I, I sold my business to Sportmart because we we're doing all their uh, uniforms anyway, and, uh, and opened up uh, a, a kind of a, I did public relations, advertising, still all going into uh, events. And then finally, I just realized that it was the events itself and specifically the entertainment part of the events that I liked. So that's when Onesti Entertainment was born and we started doing festivals and we started doing some things at racetracks and it just evolved into all of this. Now, uh, I understand that... Uh that little time of your life uh, got you inducted into the 16 inch softball yeah. hall of fame. <laughs> yeah, as much as I would love to be in it for the longest home run or, you know, <laughs> golden glove award. Uh, my brother and I actually were inducted at, um, yeah, inducted in the hall of fame. Again, it was more of uh, the, because of that softball super show and because of really uh, promoting and, um, uh, supporting and sponsoring so many softball events, we really fostered uh, the 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 16 inch softball as a sport itself. And we produced all these different tournaments and special events, and and we gave out prizes, you know, like a scholarship kind of a thing. And uh, and we uh, that's why we're inducted because uh, we took we we came in at a time when softball was just you know kind of just there. And we took it to a level that it was, I mean, it was the game in the 80s, man. Yeah, it was, definitely was. It still so, uh, is pretty much. Yeah. So I, I know you're, you're very proud of your Italian uh, heritage. Yeah, man. And, uh, and, uh, and you're involved with a lot of organizations uh, because of that. Am I correct? Well, as far as the Italian-American thing goes, you know, I mean, I'm brought up, you know, I'm born on Taylor Street. So that was a big deal back then. And um, still is. And um you know, uh, just just the pride in our heritage uh, as everybody. I mean, I'm Italian American, proud of it, just like anybody else from any other ethnicity. And um, being from uh, the an Italian neighborhood, um, you know, you you start of uh, um, it kind of uh, the organizations came to us. You know what I mean? You you found out about them, and Columbus Day Parade uh, was a big deal. I first got involved in the Italian American community with the festivals, ironically, you know, back when Jane Byrne was mayor of Chicago, she's really uh, kickstarted the whole festival concept, you know, with Chicago Fest. And, you know, back in the 70s, there really weren't festivals like as we know them today. There are some church picnics, some block parties, a couple of big things, but not really big. 
And then uh, Jane Byrne started doing, she did six neighborhood festivals and they're all ethnic. She did, and then she, she did, um, two of them was um, the Polish Fest at Hanson Park uh, one day right there. And I went to Weber High School, which is right there on Fullerton Central, uh, off of Fullerton Central. So, um, so uh, uh, I got involved in this, uh, in this last second in this festival uh, that she had out there. It was just a one day, eight hour festival. Remember, the health department didn't exist as far as festivals go. So I went out there and uh, they let me in with frozen bananas. And I had, you know, the TV dinner uh, 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 tables, you know, that we have and a crock pot. And uh, an extension cord, you know, not a three prong, nothing like that. I put chocolate in there. I froze, uh, I don't know, about a hundred bananas, and I put on wax paper and RC cola, you know, boxes. And uh, and for eight hours, all I did was just dunk bananas and sell them for two bucks. And I had a a, 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 a stack of cash. It was unbelievable. So I kept on getting involved with that and uh with the different festivals um and i just kept on kept on growing from there and uh um the next week was the italian festival at reese park and tony bennett was there and it just so happened that my aunt her office was next door to the organization's office was running that and i said hey aunt could you get me involved in this festival and she did she called her friend marie who was in charge of this organization called the joint civic committee of italian americans and I got into this uh, neighborhood festival. It was eight hours. Made you know some great money for for a one day thing when you're a 17, 18 year old kid. And from that that moment on, for the next 40 years, I've been involved in so many Italian American organizations and um, the Italian festivals. Uh, they, you know, we put those on now. One on Taylor Street, the one in Addison, the one in, in Chicago by Oakley and 24th. And um, I'm very very proud of that. And you're involved with the Sports Hall of Fame as well, correct? Well, yeah, that's uh, another big part of my life. Um, you know, going back to the Italian thing, you know, I'm, I was really, really honored. Uh, and it happened just before my mom had passed. So it was a big deal for me that, um, you know, in Italy, there's a thing that is similar to in England. You know, when you get knighted in England, there's a similar thing in Italy. It's called Cavaliere. And, uh, and the, the president of Italy, along with the Consul General of Chicago, they, they gave me this prestigious award. And I'm actually a cavaliere. Uh, it's 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 like a sir, uh, and which I don't that's, talk about this very much because people are like, "What?" But it's the real deal. Oh, that's awesome. I've done that's awesome. to promote my Italian heritage, so I'm pretty proud of that. That's uh, very cool. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Sports you- Hall of Fame again, a big deal for me. Uh, the president and founder was like a second dad to me. He just passed away, a, a victim of a, an automobile accident. Uh, few months ago it's it's very devastating uh so now it's closed on taylor street everything's on uh, in storage you're trying to figure out what to do with it but that was something we took uh from 1977 as a boxing hall of fame to uh be a national organization um honoring the the top italians and italian americans in the world actually now it's an international thing and and we've had galas every year with Joe Montana and Dan Marino and Joe DiMaggio. And this last one, I spent a lot of time with Mario Andretti, who's actually a very good friend. Um, it's just a, a big part of my life. Now, and is uh, and a veterans museum, I understand, too, the Italian American mm-hmm. Veterans Museum. Yeah, man, you guys have really been up late doing your research. Well, you know, uh, I, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I have. A, if you've been to my shows uh, at the Arcata Theater, you know that, uh, or anywhere really, I'm always, you know, saluting our veterans. I'll come out on the stage before the show, and I'll salute first responders and nurses and teachers, and, and you know, um, war veterans are a real big deal to me because I was brought up in a World War II household. My dad was was a World War II uh, uh, Army hero, and. Um, you know, just his, his teachings have always guided me um, in my life. And his teachings were always based around his time um, in, in, in Italy, in, in France, you know, on, on the front lines. He was in the infantry. He was in the foxholes. And um, so Paul Basil and a few other people uh, got this uh, Italian uh, War Veterans Museum going in Stone Park. And, uh, and I got involved as much as I can. I still am. I'm on the board. And uh, again, it's, it's a great uh, salute to those Italians and, or Americans of Italian descent that uh, many of them gave their lives, but at least definitely gave of their, their soul uh, to protect uh, this country. Um, everywhere, all the way down to from the Civil War, uh, there's uh, uh, families who brought in some memorabilia from their, their, uh, their uh, uh, distant family members who were in Civil War, World War I, and then of course, World War II and beyond. So um, it's a great place to check out, man. It really, really is. And, and uh, the Columbus Day Parade, what, what's the deal with that? That's just silly. 
that they're canceling or they're, they're not calling it Columbus Day anymore? Yeah, it's well, you know, that's a very, very volatile issue right now. Yes, the it Italian is. American, uh, the Joint Civic Committee of Italian Americans is the organization that's pretty much spearheading it for us here in the Chicagoland area. This is a national uh uh, initiative too, you know the whole Indigenous People's Day instead of Columbus. Right. Columbus was a murderer. Columbus was this and that, and you know it's like anything else. You know it's it's you know uh, Columbus himself. Uh, I mean the people who want to judge what he did or what he um, what he accomplished or didn't accomplish. You know I mean it's 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 such an editorial of of civilization at the time. You know um, I mean. You know, the whole Native American thing, we do respect very, very much. Um, but, you know, if you look at what Washington did, you look at what Thomas Jefferson did, you look what they did with slaves, you look at, the, you know, it was a product of, of the civilization and society at the time. Exactly. And now people are stepping up. And again, people, I think, are just looking for causes these days. You know, Columbus Day, it's, you know, people are, 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 are you know, there are certain organizations that are trying to change Columbus Day. And it's and Columbus Day has evolved in what, much more than what, who or what Christopher Columbus was or did or accomplished. Columbus Day is the one day of the year where Italians and Spaniards and others, um, you know, we celebrate, we celebrate our heritage. And to, for any organization to try to take that away from us, that's, that's the bad thing. And yeah, we're fighting it. We're trying. And, and they're, they're not right now. We haven't taken it away as a holiday. It's still a holiday. But what you what you've been hearing in the news lately is that the Chicago public schools removed it as a holiday. And they did that a very wrong uh, uh, process. You know, they did that without voting, without, you know, getting the community involved, without their board of directors, which is kind of a weird, weird thing. So that's what's happening now. Our organization is at the forefront. Our president. Um, our human relations director there at the forefront fighting this thing tooth and nail. Uh, it, it, to me, it's a shame, you know, but, but it is, it's not, it's, it is terrible. I mean, you can, you, you, you can get a different to holiday for whatever you want. Why take over one? It's already there. <laughs> <laughs> and Columbus day stands for something very, very important to uh, us Italian Americans. And, um, you know, to, to try to take that away from us is, is just uh, it is it's, it, it's mean, it's cruel and, and un- unnecessary. I, I agree with you. So tell, so, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, some of your media uh, involvement. I know you write a, you write a column in the Daily Herald and, yeah. and, uh, and you were, you had a show on WGN. I don't know if you still, do you still have that show. No, I'm all about promoting music and our businesses. And, you know, over the past 40 years, I have uh, amassed a certain amount of uh, experiences and uh, stories and, and, and people love to hear the behind the scenes uh, stories. And, um, and I got hundreds of them and many of them are true. No, they're all true. Um, but, um, but it's true. I mean, I, I do my morning walks every day now just to keep people engaged on uh, Facebook post at eight thirty nine o'clock. This morning was my experiences with the Beatles, meeting Ringo and Paul and Yoko and, and, and at the Rocker Hall of Fame. That's a whole other story. But, um, but yeah, I mean, people just love to hear that stuff. So um, I've been doing for almost two years now a thing called Backstage with Ron and Esty every Friday uh, in the, day, the time out uh, section. And it's just, you know, it's just me talking. I'm not a journalist whatsoever. I just write how I talk. You know, there's definitely some punctuational challenges um, <laughs> because I'm not a writer. But I just, again, you know, that's every Friday. And people seem to like it. The Daily Herald said, says it's, it's definitely at the top of, of uh, most, the most read things in the paper and most, you know, uh, um, awaited things in the paper. Um, WGN, same thing. They, I have a, uh, we we're doing a podcast for a while. Um, and it's still up there if you uh, – Google my name and WGN, you'll see me interviewing, you know, Leonard Skinner and, and Three Dog Nights and just all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I'm on the radio, I'm on TV. I do a lot just because of not for me personally. Nobody cares about me. It's all about the music, really. And uh, and people love it, you know. It's so tell us, uh, the Arcata Theater, was that your first uh, venue that you started with? Uh, yeah, you know, as far as a venue itself, you know, brick and mortar. Yeah, I would say that's the the, the main one and the, the first big one there. You know, I first got that. Uh, I was managing, I'm sure you guys heard of American English, the Beatles tribute. It's been around for so many years. I was managing them at the time. And we just, um, uh, our podcast that's out this week is uh, is Rosie and the Rivets, who I know oh, yeah. uh, could play. And, and Frank, I know Frank uh, Canino played with American English. 
well, Frank Canino, um, I think he's 38 years old now or 36, something like that. I've known Mr. Canino since he's four years old. Uh, oh. I told you I was in the printing business back then, remember? Well, right. Frank Canino's mother and father, remember, this is before computers and all we had, you know, this is back in the day. Right. So typesetting was done by another uh, person, you know, and they would give me the pieces of paper, all the typesetting, you know, when we're doing the printing. His parents did, um, used to have a typesetting company and printing company did all kinds of things. So I was by his mom and his dad and his dad's still kicking um, Frank um, senior. Uh, I was there probably every day for many years. And oh, no Frank kidding. was a little rug rat running around, running around a four five, six, eight years old. And now again, he's 30 something and, and he's uh, doing such a great job. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I was uh, managing the, the, um, Going back to the other uh, story, I was managing American English, and uh, they had uh, played at the Arcata Theater, which was just a four-dollar Bruin view. Frankly, a disaster of a venue. I mean, holes in the walls, bad paint, uh, uh, lights hanging. I was just really, really terrible, yeah. ready to go down. And um, and but the one uh, live, they did one or two live shows a year, and one of them was American English, and we'd sell it out. So the second year, I called. Uh, I was trying to get a hold of the uh, the people who had the theater. And they weren't um, they weren't responding. I'm like, hey, we, you know, this is a good gig for us. I mean, people love to us uh, a plane over there. So I kept on trying, trying. So I finally took a ride out there. And now we were living uh, at Harlan and Irving at the time. So St. Charles, a hop, skip, and a plane right away. Um, I drove all the <laughs> yeah. way out there. And uh, there was a dumpster out there with wood sticking out there. I started to take it apart because what they were going to do is they were going to make that a um, uh, like an office building and put floors, uh, two floors in where the theater, the big room is. So we started making um, offers. I said, just t- talking to the owners and stupid offers. And before I knew it, I had the business. And uh, then it was like, now what are you going to do? Because be careful what you wish for. Now you got it. And it, was, <laughs> right. uh, it was a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort. But you know, here we are. Fifth, this is our 15th anniversary. And um, we're going through a, a huge, huge renovation, a $3 million renovation. And uh, you're not going to recognize this place uh, by June. So, you know, it's kind of happening at the right time, unfortunately, unfortunately. Well, I know you've done a lot for the community there as well, I'd say, Charles. I mean, helping to build up the, uh, the entire downtown area. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, you, you got to be. I mean, that place was built for the community. Um, and I've always said, you know, I've never said no to any uh, not for profit wanting to use it. We work it out. You know, I'm very proud to be part of that St. Charles Fox Valley community. It's a, it's a very proud community, a, a great community, a, a, a forward thinking community. And uh, they've welcomed me with open arms. They've supported me. And uh, it's just a great area. I mean, it just is a beautiful area and so many new things happening over there. And now you're planning on doing the same in Des Plaines? Yeah, this is a project that I've actually been, you know, um, somewhat involved in for the last, I don't even know, 10, 12 years, um, really? uh, one way or another, because I, they, you know, I've always been had the interest of being a part of that property. That property has been distressed for a long time. And then uh, finally, the um, they put out, uh, the city bought it, City of Des Plaines, um, with the help of uh, the uh, uh, Rivers Casino. And uh, they put it out there about you know, looking for a company that would be the right one to to take it to the level of where we're at, not only the, the entertainment, but there's food opportunities there and beverage opportunities. So the city uh, uh, came to me and um, we met several times. They put out an RFP to other companies as well. And I was awarded, and I, I consider this an award, uh, the exclusive uh, contract to, uh, to run that theater and, and put my restaurants in there, my speakeasy in there, my bars in there. And, um, and I'm telling you, the city, that's another great, unbelievably supportive community and uh, what they're doing with their downtown is just unbelievable. Um, you're not going to recognize that in the next couple of years. It's just, uh, it's just so, we got a very young mayor there and he's really forward thinking a great city council uh, as in St. Charles. And they're just doing a lot of uh, build up and, and, uh, and thankfully they're making both St. Charles and Des Plaines are making the, the downtown theaters uh, the kind of the focal point and the central um, of, of all this development. So, you know, I'm excited to be able to do uh, both uh, of those properties. Uh, I mean, both of our properties. It's, uh, we're looking to open that probably around October. Very nice. Now you also have the Club Arcada at, at the, uh, at the, yeah, so, uh, at the um, theater. Yeah, so in, in, um, <clears throat> in 20, let's see here. So 2016, 
make sure I'm doing this right. Yes, 2016 was the theater's 90th anniversary. And um, so I wanted to do something that would, you know, it was open in 1926. I want to do something a little bit about the Roaring Twenties. And the whole thing started out as, as doing, because I got some memorabilia from when it first opened, first program, one of the original seats, one of the original speaker things. I mean, some, you know, just a few things, some, uh, some great photos. And I thought I would do, it started as a, as a little corner of some room as a, a little exhibit. And then from an exhibit, I said, you know, if I put like a little bar there, we could do kind of like a little speakeasy feel. Like just, just a little bar, a little four foot bar or something. So we found a room on a third floor. So that which is now uh, the library. When you first walk in, is a library. That was just that little room. That was going to be the entire speakeasy feel. Again, to be more of an exhibit in honor of the 90th anniversary of the theater. And then I walked around the city to see what they, what they thought, if I could have people up there, because the place was, again, on the third floor was a disaster. Um, things hanging, holes in the walls, all that kind of thing. And I saw there were all these little walls, all little, um, yeah, like little rooms. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, and I walked around the city. I said, man, it'd be great if I could knock down these walls. We could maybe do something bigger. But I didn't think we could because it's on the historic registry. So, you know, you can't really touch buildings uh -huh. when it's like that. Right. Um, they said, no, these walls were put up uh, about 20, 30 years ago. You can knock them down. So 20 minutes later with a sledgehammer, I had this big open room. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I, I opened up the drop ceiling, and I, and I realized that it had really great high ceilings in there. So we pulled that down, and it just all happened. And if you come into the speakeasy, it's pretty amazing. I have to say, a lot of people, Howie Mandel, it's his favorite place on the planet. He went on video saying that uh, 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 Billy Gibbons is easy top, Paul Anka, all the big celebrities love that place. It's over 400 antiques, and uh, each room has its own personality. We got a Louis Armstrong bar and a Prohibition lounge and, and Charlie Chaplin's little tramp room and our um, uh, Fred and Ginger ballroom and just some great, you know, our great Gatsby room. And I tell you, not one, I didn't draw anything out. There's not, there's no architects involved, no designers, all that. Just, I looked at it and said, you know, let's make that gold and let's make that brass. Let's make that copper. Let's put this painting there. Just all just happened. Okay. I don't know how people ask me how, I don't know how. I'm not a designer. I'm not an architect, but I had a vision. I had a feeling uh, of what it was supposed to look like. And that's, that's how it all happened. So, and because of that, you know, people come from all over the world to see it. And we've got other speakeasies that we're, uh, we're opening up. And one of them is going to be, Bourbon and Brass, which is a former place I had in Evanston. They sold that the building. They're knocking it down. So we moved Bourbon and Brass. We're moving that over to Displays. Okay. Oh, it's going to be at the Displays Theater as well? Yeah, that's going to be at the Displays Theater. We have another place in Highwood called Ron Onesti's Club 210 of Highwood. Uh, that's been around since 1946, a uh, former bowling alley. Uh, all the lanes are just covered with 4 by 8 of plywood. It's really interesting. And uh, it's, it's a music club and restaurant and great bar. And that's a, it's a great place to go hear music or a great place to dance. I've had that since, uh, I think, August or September. And um, until this all happened, it was just the most ha happening place out in Highwood, Highland Park area. People were just loving it. And, um, you know, that's where we're at. We have another thing we're probably going to ask about. Um, World War II uh, era, uh, uh, kind of a uh, western town, Wild West town, out in Union, Illinois. That's been around for, they've had it now since it was open, uh, uh, they've had it 45 years, uh, the same family, the Donnelly family, and they approached me last year to uh, help take that to the next level. It's, a, it's an amusement park, um, family style amusement park, and um, it's, a great, it's a great little place, and they opened up a restaurant there called Bebop Alula's Rockabilly Cafe. <laughs> and it's you know, based on Elvis and Johnny Cash and Patsy yeah. Cline and you know, cowboy steaks and burgers and you know, it's a, it's just a cool thing right out there by Marengo Woodstock, you know, so you know, we're, we're, we're busy. That's very good. I'm looking forward to 210. Uh, hopefully yeah, man, it's we just a day. great place. Yeah. Really great place. Hopefully we get, uh, we get a date change back there. So, so um, yeah, man. I, I got to ask you about some, now you have some restaurants, I understand. Or I know you love to cook. Yeah, I do. Well, those are my restaurants. Right now, my restaurants are uh, Club Arcada, uh, Speakeasies are uh, one I of my restaurants. Club 210 is a restaurant. Uh, Bebopalula is Rockabilly Cafe. That's a restaurant. Um, then we've got food service operations in the, uh, uh, in the amusement park. Um, you know, I'll have um, – I haven't named it yet, uh, but there's going to be um, 
a steakhouse and steak and crab house that I'm, and, and doing piano lounge uh, in the uh, Arcata Theater building because we're doing a, a massive uh, build out there. So that'll be a high-end restaurant. On the other side where Starbucks used to be on the corner, that's going to be uh, my uh, rock and za rock and roll pizza experience. So that'll be another restaurant. And then plus we'll have the restaurants. We'll probably do another rock and za pizza experience in displays. Plus another speakeasy up. So that's going to be the uh, bourbon brass speakeasy. So there's a lot of restaurants and bars, and I I find it hard to keep track of it myself. Are you still doing the frozen bananas anywhere? You know that's a great. <laughs> I, I really should bring that back at least at the uh, at the amusement parks. I might do that thanks to you. Thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> tell us some, tell us a little bit about um, some of the acts that you. Uh, that you've personally uh, 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 that you love at, at the Arcata and some of some of the uh, the big name acts and and uh, and if you got any good stories about some of them, um, maybe who uh, who are hard to deal with or something. Well, you we know, don't have to again, mention we don't have to mention any names or anything. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> well, I you know I'm very lucky. You know I'm uh, I'll be 58 uh, on May 8th. Uh, you know, and I was I'm a you know a child of the of the, the, the glorious seventies, you know, the classic rock era. Sure. And, um, and I feel I was born at the right time because I was just at the tail end. You know, I, I experienced the sixties to a degree at the tail end, you know, the whole fifties thing. Um, you know, again, growing up in a world war two household, I was, I was made familiar with that, you know, the prohibition era music and also the swing and big band and uh, Benny Goodman and Glenn Miller. Um, and then still being, you know, in college age, the 80s with the hair band. So musically, I think I was born just at the right time. And um, and what the Arcata came, uh, has come to be for me is a place for just to bring all the music that I like personally. I, I just love, you know, people say they love what kind of music you love. Uh, well, I love all kinds of music. I really do. And, yeah. um, and that's what the Arcata has been. I've been booking things, all those bands, almost every one of those bands, are bands that I love. And it just so happens that I, you know, I kind of, my likes kind of represent a generation. And, um, and the good news is that even though, you know, the, the, the fifties, uh, 50 year olds and 60 year olds and 70 year olds, you know, love what I do from the, from the uh, foreigners and the Americas to the Wayne Newtons and Paul Anka's of the day. Um, but, you know, 12 year olds love the who and 15 year olds love Zeppelin. And so, you know, it's, it's multi-generational uh, generational music that we do. And plus, I'm a big fan. I'm, a, I'm just a super fan myself. I'm a fan of, uh, 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 you know, legends and icons. You know, we've had, uh, I've done uh, uh, interviews. You know, I do my own interviews on stage and some, some great ones. I, I just, uh, not too long ago, we did um, Priscilla Presley which was just incredible two hours uh, with her on stage. Uh, Barbara Eden from Ijima Genie. Uh, we did uh, uh, Burton Cummings and Randy Bachman. Uh, I mean, just so many on, you know, Michael Bolton, uh, Ricky G, just great interviews, you know, and, and uh, um, funny guy. And um, so I love the, uh, I love the, uh, the icons. Shirley MacLaine we did. I did, I did the Mickey Rooney's 89th birthday at the theater. I did Patty Page's 90th birthday. Um, just so many, once again, these legends and icons that I just, you know, people that I grew, I'm just a fan of, you know. Um, so that's, you know, those are the things that I, I love to do. Um, you know, I, I get asked about so many stories. Um, you know, the one today that I did on my walk uh, this morning was about meeting the Beatles. Um, people are like, what is my experience with the Beatles? So basically what happened was I was doing a um, uh, a corporate event I do a certain you know a certain number of corporate events around the country as well that want you know some of these bands and I was doing one in San Francisco and uh we had um uh Cheap Trick and Joan Jett there it was a great night private event I mean it was incredible right and um Sounds and I like happened fun. to be with Joan Jett who's who uh, her, her manager Kenny Laguna is the old friend and she's just a great lady he worked with her several times and I happened to be with her backstage at our event when she got the call that she was being inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame and so she jumped in my arms jumped in kenny's arms she was like going crazy and she says you called me the good luck charm and she invited me to come to the uh, induction ceremonies i said sure i'll come you know i'd love to didn't expect anything well a few weeks later i got in the mail i got two lanyards lanyard number 100 number 101 that were for the rock and roll hall of fame induction ceremonies that they sent me and how cool is that so, um, I mean, it was amazing. So I went out there. My brother came with me because he brought his uh, video camera. He's our, you know, technical production guy. So he was out there. Doing, I said, I want to record every bit of this. It's going to be great. 
I never got any tickets to the event though. So I was a little worried and didn't realize until I actually landed in Cleveland. This was uh, the 30th anniversary of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and only the third time that they actually had uh, the induction ceremonies in Cleveland where it's located because of the, oh. uh, because of the anniversary. So we got into Cleveland, walked around, got there early. I was in this, in this platinum jacket and a t-shirt so I could try to look cool, you know, and uh, like a rock and roller. And, um, and I got there, as I said, early, and, uh, and, and I, I didn't know where to, where to go. And I was just, I kept on going to guys with the earplugs in and the lanyards themselves, you know, and they kept pointing me forward, pointing me forward. So I kept on going from here to there, didn't know where to go. And they finally pointed me to, to the red carpet. I walked onto the red carpet, like, okay, I, I was waiting to get, like, you know, wrestled to the ground, a full body cavity search, but it didn't happen. All these cameras, all these flashes were, were, were happening. And, um, and I happened to see uh, a, a, a truck, like a van or a bus that had Fallout Boy uh, on there, the, the logo. And it turns out Fallout Boy was there because Green Day was being inducted that night as well, and Fallout Boy was induct inducting them. So people were like taking pictures. They say, can we take a picture with you? I'm like, sure. And then, you know, and I'm like, did you ever hear the Arcata theater? And they said, what? I said, don't worry about it. You know, they didn't know who I was. They just thought I'm walking. I must be somebody. So finally somebody said, who are you? I'm like, did you ever hear of fallout boy? They said, yeah. And I just kept walking. I didn't say I was with them. I just asked if they were, if they heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> I with Fall Out Boy. all these flashes and stuff. And to this day, there's pictures of me in all these scrapbooks. And people are like, who's that? And they're, I've probably been made up of uh, different identities to 400 people. But, um, <laughs> I finally get in. And uh, I, I go to the registration table. And, uh, and I said, I don't have a ticket. Uh, do, can you tell me where to go? And she looked at my, la my lanyard. And she looked up my numbers. And she took a piece of paper and just ripped the corner off. I mean, literally, just a little corner and wrote the number four on there. She said, here, just use that. I'm like, you're kidding, right? No, no, just use that. So I walked in. The security level one, security level two kept on showing my lanyard and this piece of paper. And they said, OK, come on in. So I, I look around, I see that it's, it's a 10,000 seat venue, the original venue that the Beatles played at in Cleveland in 1964 when they did the, uh, the, uh, the first tour. And, uh, and it turns out that Ringo Starr was going to be inducted uh, that night too. That's why they had it there and where the Beatles were. It was really uh, magical. So again, I'm looking at all these seats in the balcony. and I'm like, we must be, you know, way in the second, it must be in the front row, like Bob Euchre would say. Uh, I would say we must be in the last row because right. who are we? Nobody, you know, all these celebrities, but they kept on saying, go forward, come forward. Well, it turns out that number four was, was they put me at Joan Jett's table a number of seat at table. Number four was up against the stage right in the front. Like, wow. Holy cow. So as I said before, we got there earlier, uh, early that day. And the first guy I saw was a uh, uh, little Steven Van Zandt, you know, from the E street band, Bruce Springsteen right. and Silvio from uh, Sopranos. Sopranos you know, sure. And, uh, and I, we know each other because we're on the board of directors of an organization called Little Kids Rock. It's a national organization that provides uh, uh, musical instruments to underprivileged inner city schools. And we have these uh, uh, fundraisers and concerts and raise money and we'll drop off, you know, 10 drum kits to one school and 20 guitars to another school, inner city schools. It's a cool organization. He's a part of a few other guys. And uh, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? It was great. So we took some pictures. Then I, I, I walked over to another table and it was a, a, a guy in a, in a wheelchair and it was Jerry Lee Lewis, which the killer, which is a legend, which I never worked with. I, I'm still trying to get into a Q and A or something. I mean, I've done things with little Richard, Chuck Berry, so many people from that era, but uh, never did anything with, with the killer. Um, and then I just, I saw Alice Cooper and I did a bunch of shows with Alice and, and his daughter was actually part of the show. She was there and, and just a lot of people we just connected with again. It's really cool. And I was standing by, um, the, uh, the stage, because uh, they started this whole thing, and this whole Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony thing, you know, it's usually two and a half, three hours, whatever it is, but it's actually like a five to six hour thing, because they, they have the people, you know, uh, uh, sing a song, and then they, okay, let's well, sing it again, different camera angles, or something messes up, or, you know, it's, it's a long thing, when it's a TV production. <clears throat> So I was standing by the stairs because our, 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 our table is right up by the stage and a guy bumps into me and it was Bill Withers, who just passed away, who was getting inducted that night as well. And he was walking, uh, holding uh, the arm of Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder bumps into me and he says, excuse me, man, I didn't see you. <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> um, and uh, so that was a story in and of itself. Yeah. So he went up there and they, they did Lean On Me uh, rehearsal and Ain't No Sunshine. is very, very cool. Uh, Again, I'm standing uh, uh, by the end of the stage there, and a guy, 
another guy bumps right into me, like with an elbow, like almost knocks me down. And it was Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters. And he helped pick me up, get, knock me down. And he, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Oh, was, you know, what can I do for you? I said, I have a picture. Oh, absolutely. We wound up talking about 10 minutes. Just a great guy he was. Yeah. I had a great picture with Dave Grohl uh, just by the men's room. <laughs> and um, so then the thing starts, the party starts, and I sit down, I, I go to my table, at least what I thought was a table, I was actually, I sit at the wrong table, went to the table next to us, because I was sitting there by myself, my brother was there, and this entourage walks in, it's Ringo Starr, and, and two ladies, and I'm like, holy cow, and he sits down at my table, I'm like, holy cow, I couldn't <laughs> believe it, and it was, and he introduces, the lady introduces herself uh, to me, I, I forgot her name, and then Ringo says, hi, I'm Ringo, I said, hi. <laughs> No kidding. And then he says, this is my lovely wife of 35 years, Barbara Bach. Remember her? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then she reintroduced me to that lady who first said hi. And that's uh, the other lady was her sister. And she asked me, would you mind moving over one seat? Because my husband's going to join us a little bit. I'm like, well, whatever you want. Oh, my God. Whatever you want. Right? Sure. So I move over. I didn't realize that Ringo Starr's brother-in-law, uh, Barbara Bach's sister's husband, Joe Walsh of the Eagles. So he's sitting really? next to me. Yeah. So he's like, hey, man, how you doing? I'm like, freaking great. <laughs> but then other people came to the table and I was sitting at the wrong table. So that was embarrassing. So I moved over to the next table. I sit down. I put my chair out. And then a lady or another chair backs up into my chair. And I turn around. It's this lady in a top hat. Well, it's Yoko Ono. I'm like, holy cow, this can't be happening. And I said, oh, my gosh, hi, Yoko. She says, hello. You know, she just said very proper. And, uh, and I said, and it, this was uh, in September, I think. And October was going to be, I think, John's 70th birthday. October 9th, I think, something like that. And I told her, I said, you know what? I, I own a theater in, in a little part of Chicago. And we're actually doing, which was true, we're, we're doing a big salute to John Lennon on his 70th, I think, or 75th, whatever it was, birthday. And she goes, oh, that's so nice. You know, and she just kept on shaking her head saying, you know, it's such a shame, such a shame. And then she goes, um, excuse me, would you mind uh, escorting me to the ladies' room? I'm like, heck, yeah. But then she was with this lady. And uh, she looked at me and winked. She goes, no, I got it. I'm like, oh, come on, let me take her to the bathroom. <laughs> to the ladies' room. I'm like, all right. So anyway, she left to go to the ladies' room. I'm like, this can't be happening, right? So the event's happening at Bill Withers. And also another table, two tables down, was uh, they're inducting uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan posthumously, but his whole band was there. And Jimmy Vaughn is a good friend of ours. He's been at the Arcada a number of times. Great guy. And I got to meet C.P. Ray Vaughn's uh, band. Just what a night. Just incredible night. Yeah. And uh, so after a while, it was just happening. And people started standing. And by the time Green Day got inducted, it would follow up boy introduced Green Day, everybody would stand up by the stage. It was that fun. You know, everybody dancing kind of thing. It was just before the finale. So everybody was ready for that. And so uh, Green Day, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're doing a number. And, uh, and, a, and a guy just, you know, next to me looks at me and goes, oh, I just love these chaps. I look at this guy. It's freaking Sir Paul McCartney standing with, right uh, with me because Ringo's wow. getting inducted. That's why Yoko's there. That's why Paul's there. Hmm. And we're just chatting back and forth. It was just great talking about music, these guys, about how Green Day, it's amazing. It seemed like they just uh, came onto the, uh, uh, um, into the public. And the fact Green Day has been around, you know, you got you to gotta be inducted. You got to be uh, around it's got to be at least 25 years from your first recording. So I, how could Green Day be this old? But, you know, Joey Armstrong, who got to be a friend, I, we still hung with him. I took the plane back with him um, and the other guys from Green Day. So it was a very, very cool night. And it's a couple of fallout boys. <laughs> and, um, and so, again, Paul McCartney was just talking about how that was our topic. Like how, you know, you look at Ringo, who's being inducted. And how long he's been in the business? Look at these guys. He's look like like just they look like babies, right. and they're getting inducted. So my brother's got all this on videotape, so much so that he actually has the uh, has the the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, what's the word uh, the privilege of being spanked, being yelled at by Paul McCartney because he just had you know he had the camera on me and and Paul the whole time, and behind him was the stage, and Paul was uh. like yelling at him. You know, mouthing him, stop videotaping, you know, quit videotaping me. And he got, he got yelled at. Uh, so, but that was today's story. So there you go. Those are the kind of things that happen to me. There's a ton of them. And, um, you know, sorry to make your ears bleed there on the headphones. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's, uh, it's awesome. It's awesome story. That's awesome. Very cool. Uh, how do people get in touch with you or, or follow you or, or follow your walks? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm pretty accessible. I really am. Um, I just have, uh, you know, my, uh, the Facebook page, you get, you know, it's, it's pretty popular. I do you know, a lot of stuff on that between my personal one and, and the pages from my other venues. Um, Oshows.com is our website. Ron at Oshows.com is my email address. I mean, anybody wants to say hi or have suggestions or anything, just pop it on down to me. Thank you. All right, Ron. Well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you and getting some insight and uh, some entertaining stories on top of it. <laughs> well, thanks, uh, Ray, Paul. So good to talk to you guys. And thanks for keeping uh, doing what you guys do to keep uh, the stories and rock and roll music alive. I know you guys are still playing and I know it's, it's in your blood. And uh, oh, yeah. that's what it is. This is all in our blood. It's all we know. It's and 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 the reality of it is, um, my column today in um, that this is being uh, uh, recorded um, uh, in the Daily Herald is about you know some of the songs that uh, of our lives. You know, uh, we got the songs we're we're dating in high school or our prom songs or the fact that when somebody passes away in the military, it's taps that's uh, uh, being. Um, uh, performed or you know when we go to show pride in our country what do we do we sing the national anthem so music is so much a part of our culture it's a much of, so much a part of our society and it's going to be a huge part of us getting back uh into swing of things when all this is over uh, absolutely i think uh, i think uh, when, once this all gets over with and and uh, we're all back to normal I, i'm pretty sure that uh, this mu- music will, will it's obviously playing a big part if you if you if you look on facebook and and people are doing shows and and uh, pledges guys playing from their from their bedroom or for their from, from their living room and it, it's it's awesome that uh, it just breaks up your day a little bit and, and helps it's necessary out. it's necessary it's, it's a music is a protein it's a vitamin that we all need i wish you guys yeah. the best as well thanks very much thank you thank you well, that was great talking with Ron. He uh, got a lot of stories there, man. I think with the Beatles, that was pretty cool. That was very cool, and uh, and Joan Jett and everything else. That was a very cool story. Yeah, he's met a lot of famous people. Uh, you know, rub a lot of shoulders, and uh, seems to be doing very well for himself. You know, he's got the Arcata. He's got he's opening up the new place in Des Plaines and Club Two Ten, and he's doing really, really well. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. It's good to hear from Ryan. And uh, glad he was able to join us for uh, for this uh, this podcast, this week's podcast. So um, don't forget to share and uh, enjoy uh, our podcast. Where can they enjoy all them at? They can enjoy our podcast anywhere they get a podcast, or they can go to our Facebook page. They can go to our website. They can go to YouTube. They got to subscribe so they never, ever miss an episode. And make sure that you're checking out the Illinois Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on Route 66 radio show, roadtorockradio.net. It's an internet-based radio show. Featuring all Illinois musicians, and every Monday at six o'clock, they feature one of our podcasts. So very check them out and support the museum. Very good, very good. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, hopefully, we'll uh, have another one lined up for you for next week, and uh, we'll talk to you then. Thank you. Arriva Dirty. Well,